Hey everyone, welcome back to Linear Algebra. This will be lecture two of the course. And in this section, we're gonna get into uh, something called the dot product. Now, if you took Calculus 3, you will, be, you will have had some experience with the dot product. Uh, it comes up early in that course as part of the uh, gear up for uh, three-dimensional uh, calculus. Um, but here we're going to give it a little more thorough of a treatment. We're going to delve into it a little bit deeper. Um, and so this is just the, f the first of several different types of products that can be defined on vectors. So we'll get started on this. Let's, uh, let's jump into this. We'll call it section 1.2, the dot product. Okay, um, let's go ahead and define the dot product. We'll start with the definition and then we'll, we'll build up some properties, do some examples, etc. So uh, let x be a vector. And we'll go ahead and write out some of the components here, x1, x2, up to xn. And we'll let y be another vector. We'll call y1, y2, yn. Okay. So these are two vectors. So x and y, we'll let them be two vectors in rn. The dot product, uh, the dot product, or sometimes called the inner product, okay, the dot product or the inner product of x and y is uh, given by the following. So x dot y. That's the notation we'll use. And basically, it's going to be what's what you think of as a sum product of the components. So it's x, uh, x1, y1, right, multiplied together, plus x2, y2, multiplied together, plus dot, 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 x, n, y, n, multiplied together. Right, and I suppose you could succinctly denote it using summation notation as i equals 1 to n of x, i, y, i. Okay. So basically, we just want to take all of the components uh, and add or multiply them against their um, corresponding components and then add the, all of those products up. And that is what we call the dot product or the inner product. Okay. Very good. Let's do a simple example and make sure we have this idea. So let's let x equal to negative 4, 3, and y equal 1, 5, negative 2. Then x dot y is 2 times 1, oops, plus negative 4 times 5, plus 3 times negative 2, right? So 2 times 1, negative 4 times 5, and 3 times 2. Okay, and so what do we get here? Well, what do we have? 2 minus 20 minus 6, so negative 24. Okay, so the dot product yields a scalar. Okay. Okay, all right, so that's the idea of the dot product. Now we're going to use this, uh, well, forever. For the rest of the course, it'll become up almost probably every in every single lecture. It's one of the fundamental things that that uh, that we one of the fundamental tools that we have in linear algebra. Let's talk about some of the properties of the dot product. So let's talk through some of the properties here. So uh, let's let x, y, z be vectors in R n. Okay, and C is a scalar. Okay, so then what do we got? Well, the dot product is commutative. So X dot Y is the same as Y dot X. Okay, so we, the, the, pro, the dot product commutes. 
Okay. Uh, if you dot some, uh, a vector against itself, then that is the same as squaring the norm of the vector. Okay. All right, so a, dot, a vector dotted against itself gives you the same output as uh, squaring the norm of the vector, right? And it's always greater than or equal to zero. Okay. All right. And we'll come back through and prove a couple of these. But let's keep moving. Some of these are very straightforward to prove. But um, let's take a look at another one. Um, x dotted against itself equals zero if and only if the vector x is the zero vector. Okay. All right. So the uh, number two says that uh, dotting a vector against itself. Uh, is equal to the square of the norm of the vector, and it's always greater than or equal to zero. Number three says it's equal to zero if and only if x happens to be the zero vector. All right. Um, a constant, right? So you get your scalar here, and then x dot y. What can we do with this? Well, uh, associativity works here, so. You can multiply the scalar times the vector first and then dot that resultant vector against the vector y. Or you can even do this. You can take x and then dot that against cy, right? So you can multiply the scalar by either of the two vectors in the dot product and then dot against the remaining vector and get the same result. So it's a kind of like a form of associativity. Okay, very good. How about this guy? So x dot y plus z. All right, so I've got y plus z is going to give me a vector, and an x dotted against that vector is going to give me a scalar. Now it turns out you can use something like the distributive property here. Right, so I can go x dot y plus x dot z. And so it works like the familiar distributive property uh, that we're all used to. Um, and then finally the result, uh, the kind of the reverse is true as well. So you can dot on either side. Right, because the dot product is commutative, this would make sense that you could do something like this, x plus y dotted with z is also going to work the same way. So you'd have x dot z plus y dot z. Okay. So uh, many of these can all can be proven. Uh, you know, by merely kind of expanding the expressions on both sides and showing they're equal to one another, right? So it's there. This is uh, great, great practice, right? If you're learning proofs, linear algebra is usually one of the first courses you'll take uh, in college, where uh, proofs are kind of the point of the course, right? So you get a theorem, you're uh, asked, asked, you're shown the proof, asked to prove it, you know. Kind of proofs are really like the point of mathematics uh, in some sense. So um, these are all great examples to practice on. Um, linear algebra proofs tend to be, at least in the elementary linear algebra world, like tend to be fairly easy to comprehend. And more often than not, they're just kind of direct proofs as well, which is nice, uh, specifically when you're learning about how to prove things. But let's prove a couple of these. I'll not prove all of them, but um, let's prove the first one, right? The first item, and that's namely that x dot y is equal to y dot x. Okay, x dot y is equal to y dot x, and so this one is really straightforward to do. We can just start with x dot y. Right? We know what that, what x and y are. That's x one x2 dot 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 xn dot y1 
y2 dot 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 yn, right? When I dot these together, then I take the corresponding components, multiply them together, and then add all of the products. And so this would be x1, y1 plus x2, y2 plus dot 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 plus xn, yn. Okay, now I, I guess technically, let's not put it in. in front. This is not a vector anymore, this becomes a, a scalar, right? A, a, a real number. Now notice um, that in this, in this e expansion here, x1, y1, these are just real numbers, right? So x1 and y1, you could easily uh, reverse the order of them, right? So in particular, I could write y1, x1 plus y2, x2 plus dot, 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 plus yn, xn, right? I mean, because these are just real numbers. I mean, this is like two times four, same as four times two. I can reverse the order. Right? And so when I do that, then I can, I can pull them apart again in just the same way as I did up here. Right? So this is going to be equal to the vector y1, y2, dot, 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 yn, dotted against x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, right? which is, of course, y dot x. Okay? So x dot y equals y dot x. So the dot product is a commutative operation. Okay. All right. So that proves one. Now the others are some. Most of them are very much like this. That, you know, a lot of times in in linear algebra. And I think I might have said this last time, but a lot of times when you're proving things, it's a good idea just to take the vector, break it apart into its more like componenty version of itself. Do the operation, expand it, and rearrange when you can, um, and then kind of uh, sometimes frequently just reverse the operation, right? So I think for that reason, linear algebra proofs are somewhat more, uh, they're somewhat easier to, to understand. And I think that's a lot of the reason why we kind of start with linear algebra as the course to learn proofs in. So they're not always easy, that's for sure. That's definitely for sure, but uh, at least at, <clears throat> At the elementary linear algebra level, they tend to be a little more straightforward. OK. All right, so um, let's take a look at, at, a new, at another theorem that relates to the dot product. Uh, and this theorem is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. OK, so this is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay, kind of a famous one, used, used a lot. Um, and so what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality gives us is it, it provides us with a upper and lower bound on the value of the dot product. Okay, so what does it say? It says if x and y are vectors in Rn, then the absolute value of the dot product of x and y is less than or equal to the product of the norms of the two vectors. Right? So careful with the notation here. So over here you got single bars. That just we're talking about an absolute value here. Right, so x dot y is going to give you a real number. Could be positive, could be negative. This is the absolute value of that. Right, and then over here you're talking about this is the norm of x. Right, so this is x1 squared plus x2 squared plus dot 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 plus xn squared. Take the square root of it. That's the norm of x. Same thing for y. Identify the two norms, multiply them together, and the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality says that in all cases the absolute value of the dot product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. Okay, so this one, let's prove this. Let's prove this. Okay, so we'll take a couple cases. Case one. Case one, if, case one is gonna be the case where 
one or the other or both of the vectors are the zero vectors. So, um, so if x equals a zero vector or y equals a zero vector. Okay. Uh, so if that's the case, then right. So if I the dot product in this case is equal to zero, right? Right. If one of the vectors has all zero components, when I multiply it against the other one, all of the all of the products will be zero, right? So you just have zero plus zero plus zero, etc. And so in that case, that's going to be less than or equal to right. So if 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 the if x is the zero vector, then the length of x is zero. So this will be zero. If y is a zero vector, this will be zero. Either way, one or both of these are zero, and so this has to be equal to zero. Okay, so case one is sort of the trivial case where one of the two vectors, where, where at least one of the two vectors is zero. Okay, so that one holds up. Okay, so that's case one. Case two then, okay, assume x and y are not the zero vector. Okay, so the, neither of them are the zero vector. Then what happens? Well, what are we what are we trying to show here? So we wish to show. What do we wish to show? We wish to show that uh, that the absolute value of x dot y is less than or equal to the product of the norms of the two vectors. Another way to say that is to say that x dot y is between these two, right? It's between this. Okay, oops, keep writing this really sloppy. <laughs> okay. Right, so we can kind of unpack this thing here. Oh, and sorry, this should say negative. There we go. And so uh, this is going to be true, right? This is true, right? This implies that negative 1 be less than or equal to x dot y over. Okay, I'm going to write it like that. I'm going to ditch the parentheses going forward. Right, I can divide both sides by the product of the of the uh, norms here. Okay. Okay. So this is true if and only if that is true. Okay. And so let's move on here. Hold on one second. Let me switch my page here. Okay. So negative one is less than or equal to x dot y. Which is less than or equal to one. Okay. So note, right? So notice that x dot y over this product of the norms of the two vectors is equal to x over the norm of x dotted against y over the norm of y. Now that comes from a, you know, so this comes from sort of some, some properties that we discussed previously of constants and how the dot product and the constants can interact, right? So this should, hopefully this is clear, but you can kind of break each of these pieces up. Think of them as one over the norm of x, one over the norm of y is a constant, and so they can be broken apart in the dot product here. Okay, and we're gonna just call these a dot b. Vectors a dot b. Now, <clears throat> the key here is both a and b, as defined, are unit vectors. Okay, so these are both unit vectors. Okay, and so what we need to what we'll, what we really need to show is that. We really need to show 
that negative one is less than or equal to a dot b, which is less than or equal to one. Okay. A dot b, um, occur so here's where we're going to get a little tricky, right? This is a little bit of a tricky proof, actually. So a, so we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of expand a dot b in a kind of a strange way and show that this all works out, right? So a dot b occurs as part of the expansion of a plus b dot a plus b, right? So a dot b occurs as part of the expansion, right? Expansion of a plus b, right? Remember these are just vectors dotted with a plus b. Okay, as well as a minus b dot a minus b. Okay, so le let's start with this one and see what see what happens here. So if I take a plus b, a vector, two vectors added together gets me another vector dot a plus b, what do I get? Well, I know that that's equal to a plus b squared, right? So the norm of a plus b squared, right? Okay, and I know that it's greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and so then what? Well, a dot a, again, these are vectors, plus b dot a, just doing the expansion here, expanding this, plus a dot b, All right, kind of foiling these out, uh, plus b dot b is therefore greater than or equal to zero. Okay, this guy here is just the norm of a squared, and then I've got b dot a and a dot b, so that I've basically got two times a dot b. And then this over here is the norm of b squared, so that's got to be greater than or equal to zero. And so a, remember, is a unit vector, and so is b, they're both unit vectors, so this and this are both equal to one, so I have one plus two a dot b plus one is greater than or equal to zero. And so obviously that means I've got two plus two a dot b is greater than or equal to zero, implying that, let's see, twice a dot b is greater than or equal to negative two, right? And so I can now at this point I can divide by positive two. And so that means a dot b must be greater than or equal to negative one. Okay. <clears throat> and so what this shows is that if a and b are two unit vectors, then their dot product uh, is greater than or equal to negative one. Okay. And so this shows, this gets us half of the inequality. All right. And then what you can do is you can run the exact same argument uh, using this one here to get the other half of the inequality. Okay, so you'd run the exact same argument. You would say, all right, a minus b dot a minus b uh, equals the norm of a minus b squared, which is greater than or equal to zero. And then you expand it just the same, except it's a minus b instead of a plus b. Right? And then you consolidate and do, do your work. And then when you get down to the bottom here, you're gonna end up having a negative right here, I believe. And when you do that, you divide by the positive and you end up getting a dot b is greater than or equal to, or le yeah, greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to one, right? Because you'll divide by a negative, flip the inequality. Right, so bottom line is it, it basically runs the exact same way, uh, except it starts from this, this vantage point. Okay, and then once you have done both of those, you get this side and you get that side, and so that implies the result. 
And so it follows that negative 1 is less than or equal to a dot b, which is less than or equal to 1, which implies the result. Okay? So, yeah, so obviously, pause the video. Um, take a moment to make sure that you can perform that exercise. Uh, but I think I think uh, this is a good blueprint for how to do it, but you just have to flip, you change the identity you start with to a minus b dot a minus b. Okay. All right. Very good. That's the proof for the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And from the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, we get to another important inequality that will, that will be used extensively. And that is the triangle inequality. Okay, so this is the triangle inequality. Okay, and this one, when we as we work through the proof of this one, you'll see that this one draws directly from the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. One of the lines of the proof references it specifically and says that because of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality this is true. So this is instructive as well as you're sort of starting out your career proving things that you realize that things that have come before uh, can't once you've proven it once you can use it successively and and that's kind of <laughs> it's kind of how mathematics is built up uh, from, from the ground up. It's one giant theorem lattice really. Okay, so let's talk through the triangle inequality. So if x uh, and y are vectors in Rn, okay, in Rn, then x plus y, the absolute, or sorry, the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. Okay, so the norm of the sum of the vectors is less than or equal to the, the norm of x plus separately the norm of y. Okay, so th it's, this is called the triangle inequality because um, it's sort of very easy to see when you just Kind of make a triangle here. So if I have a vector x, like that looks like that, and then I have another vector y, and I kind of arrange them in this fashion, right? Tail to tail. Um, then x plus y produces this vector, doesn't it? We've seen this. We saw this in the previous section. You should get this third vector from the sum of these two. So all this is saying is that the length of the third vector, namely the length of this thing, has got to be less than or equal to the length of these two. Okay, so if the third vector x plus y is built up of the other two x and y, then the length of x plus y is needs to be e less than or equal to the length of x plus the length of y. All right, and so it's very intuitive when you see it in a drawing like this. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and prove this. Okay, and for this proof, um, we're going to start with this guy, x plus y squared. And we're going to start with this, and then we'll get to the result itself. Notice the result is not x plus y squared, but we're going to start with this for our for our proof. Okay, so we can we can start to expand this, and we can see that this we know from previous theorem that this is equal to x plus y dot x plus y, and we know that we can expand this, and this is equal to x dot x plus two times x dot y plus y dot y. Right, these are all vectors. Okay. And we know that x dot x is the same as the norm of x squared. And 
and this is going to be 2 dot plus 2x dot y still. And then of course on the other side y dot y is the same as the norm of y squared. Okay. Now um, here's where we'll start to um, so this guy here is going to be less than or equal to now what we're going to do is we're going to so first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert this to an absolute value okay so so this will be two times the absolute value of x dot y right and so so in that case like if it was negative here it, this would be less than this right but if they're both positive then they'll remain equal right so all this is doing is potentially making this one larger okay so that's not a problem and then we're going to by doing that we've set up this middle term so that we can apply the cauchy schwartz inequality okay and so what we can say now is that <clears throat> the norm of x squared so this guy here, the norm of x squared plus 2 times the absolute value of x dot y plus the norm of y squared is less than or equal to the norm of x squared plus 2 times, and then it's the norm of x times the norm of y. Right? These are, again, scalars, so they're just multiplied together normally, and then plus the norm of y squared. Right. <clears throat> so we've got an inequality here, right? So we had a strict equality up to this point, and then we said, oh, we're going to make this an absolute value here. And so that means this one could get bigger. If, in particular, if x dot y was negative here, it would now be positive, which makes the sum larger. Okay, so that's why we need the inequality. And then similarly here, we're going to use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality to go from, from here to here. And we know that this could be bigger than this. Okay. So I'll just put a note here. This is the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality happening between these two lines. Okay. All right, but then once you get it to this section, right, we know that this is going to be equal to, what is it? Well, it's the, the norm of x plus the norm of y squared. <clears throat> okay, so what have we shown? We've shown that the norm of x plus y squared, right, the norm of the vector x plus y, when you square that norm, that's going to be less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y quantity squared. Okay, so this is less than or equal to this guy here right and uh, that's not what the theorem's about but we can easily just take a square root of both sides right All right so if I take the square root then I get what I'm really after which is this guy Perfect, right? That's exactly what I want. So if I take the square root of the square over here, and I take the square root of the square over here, then I get this. And so that's the triangle inequality. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay, so we've proven the triangle inequality as well as the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Great. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's that part. Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about what the dot product can do for us. So the dot product, I mean, in addition, it's this, it's this number that gets spit out when we uh, do a sum product on the components of two vectors. So you get some number, right? But additionally, the dot product um, enables us to find the angle between two vectors. Okay, so if I have, for example, 
some vector y and some other vector x. Right, and I want to know the angle between them. The dot product can help me with this. Right? So right now we're talking about xy uh, vectors in R2 or R3 for now. For now, because those are sort of the spatial uh, realms that we're kind of used to. Right, so that's what we're talking about right now. Um, we'll later expand this to uh, Rn in general, but let's start here. Right, so let's say I have this two, these two vectors drawn like this, and I've got a third vector then between the two, which I can just call x minus y. Okay. Um, so uh, the theta that we that we identify here, we're always technically speaking, two vectors like this x and y, uh, they technically will identify two angles, right? So you got theta, the sort of smaller angle between them in this context, and then you got the larger angle outside. So we're always going to be talking about the angle that's between zero and pi. Okay, it's always possible to do that, right? So we're always going to be considering theta to be the the smaller uh, of the two angles that are implied, and namely the, the, the angle that falls between 0 and pi. Okay, so given that and given this triangle, uh, if you can recall back to your trigonometry days, there was something called the law of cosines. Right, so it was, the, it was called the law of cosines, right? And it's all about the relationship between the angles of a triangle and the length of the sides of the triangle. And so the law of cosines in our context would be stated like this. X minus Y, the norm. Now remember, when I say norm, I'm just talking about the lengths. Okay, so the length of this side of this triangle that I've drawn out here is going to be equal to the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared minus two times the norm of x times the norm of y times cosine of theta. Okay, And so this is, again, something called the law of cosines from trigonometry. If you went through a trig course, you definitely went through this, you talked through this, this is a major, major topic there. There's also a law, law of sines as well. The law of cosines is the one that we're referencing here. And so just recall that in that trig class, it would have been, you know, A, B, and C, right? So maybe this is A, that's B, that's C, and then your angles were little a, little b, and little c, right? But this is a way to relate the sides of the, the length of the sides of the triangle uh, to the angle of the, the angles of the triangle. And so there were different versions of the law of cosines. This is one of them. Okay, and so <clears throat> this is the law of cosines, just st strictly speaking. Um, but then we also have right something that we've just discussed. Uh, we know that the norm of x minus y, right, this length here, if we square it, we know that that's going to be equal to x minus y dot x minus y. Okay, which we know is x dot x minus 2 times x dot y plus y dot y. Okay, so that's just expanding this, right? So this is the identity we kind of discussed earlier in the lecture, but then this is just expanding that. And then also taking this thing here a little bit further, we know that this is the norm of x squared. Uh, and this over here is the norm of y squared. So in between I have this. Okay. Now between these two equations, there's a couple of things that I want to we want to we want to first draw attention to this here, which I'm going to call one. Okay, and then secondarily I want to draw attention to this here, which I'm going to call two. Now these two must be equal. 
can we see can we see why these two must be equal well this expression here is equal to this this expression here is equal to this right so that means this guy here and this guy here are equal probably don't need to write this out but I'm going to just to make sure this is clear okay so this is just one well sorry scratch that that's this is the whole the whole expression here that's going to be equal to this okay so I've got this and this and I've got that and that and so here's your one here's your two they're equal right okay so so this is going to imply that negative 2 times the norm of x times the norm of y times cos theta is equal to negative 2 x dot y. Okay, x and y are all vectors here. Okay, and so then we can quickly just do a little bit of division and we see that cosine of y, uh, cosine of theta is equal to x dot y divided by this, the norm of x, the norm of y, times cosine of theta. Okay, And so x and y are two vectors in the plane. They, have, they share the same initial point, but obviously they share different terminal points. Theta is the angle between them. Okay, and so <clears throat> um, this formula will allow us to find theta, find the angle between them. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do an example. Let's see how we can use this. Okay, so let's uh, let x equal 6 comma negative 4 and y equal negative 2, 3. Let's find theta between x and y. Let's find the angle. So what we saw before was that the cosine of theta is x dot y over the norm of x times the norm of y. Okay. And so in this case, x dot y is going to be, well, let's write it out. So it'll be 6 times negative 2 plus negative 4 times 3. The norm of x is going to be 36 plus 16. So that is 52. The norm of y is going to be 4 plus 9. And so that is square root of 13. And so what do I get here? I get negative 24, so that's 12 plus 12, or sorry, neg negative 12 minus 12. So I get negative 24 over the square root of, so 52 is actually 13 times 4. All right, so I can kind of break this apart, and I get negative 24 over 2 times 13, and so I get negative 12 over 13. Okay, well, so that's what cosine of theta is equal to. I think I might have put a square, put a box around it a little too early. That's not exactly what we're after. Cosine of theta is equal to negative 12 over 13, and so we can just use the inverse cosine, like so and plug that into a calculator and you're going to get some you'll get some value for that right some angle in radians or degrees depending on how you have your calculator set okay. but you can identify the angle between your x and your y just like that okay so this was so we kind of i mean intuitively this sort of makes a lot of sense in in r2 for sure, and in, even in R3 it makes sense. But in higher dimensional spaces, uh, we sort of step outside of our everyday experience a little bit, right? And, 
and in such you know in these kinds of things like it's we're, we haven't really defined what we mean by the angle between two vectors uh, but notice that uh, what about so what about higher dimensions well notice that uh, x dot y over the norm of x times the norm of y so this ratio is always between negative one and one right we can see that because of the cauchy schwartz inequality right so if this is true then that means we can we can use this guy here we can always run the inverse cosine on on this means basically that whatever we get for this value here it's going to be in the domain of the inverse cosine function right which means we can do this for pretty much any vector in rn okay so we can do, we can do this for any vector vectors in rn okay and so that leads us kind of to this nice definition of what we mean by the angle between two vectors it's intuitive what we mean by that in in r2 and even in r3 but what do we mean by the angle between two vectors in you know 10 dimensional space in in r10 well here's what we mean by it okay so let x and y be two non-zero vectors in Rn, okay? And then specifically n greater than or equal to two, we'll say. Then the angle between x and y is the unique uh, is the un is the unique angle between zero and pi uh, radians, of course, whose cosine is equal to and. Here it is, x dot y divided by the norm of x times the norm of y. Okay, so basically what we're saying here is that you can just extend this intuition into higher dimensional spaces. All right, so for n greater than or equal to 2, we can, uh, we can just use this definition, and it means the same thing as we go up into higher dimensions beyond r2 and r3 okay so so it continues to work is is the is the takeaway the nice the nice feature here let's do an example okay let's uh let x equal negative one four two zero negative three and y equal two one negative four negative one zero what's the angle between these two vectors well we just have to find the norm of x right and that's going to be negative one squared plus four squared plus two squared plus zero squared plus negative three squared Take the square root of that. The norm of y is going to be 2 squared plus 1 squared plus negative 4 squared plus negative 1 squared plus 0 squared. Okay, here you're going to get the square root of 30. Here you get the square root of 22. What's x dot y? Well, it's negative 1 times 2 plus 4 times 1 plus. 2 times negative 4 plus 0 times negative 1 plus negative 3 times 0. Right? If you go through all of that, you get negative 2 
plus 4, minus 8, plus 0, plus 0, and so you get negative 6. Right? And so then the angle cosine of theta is equal to x dot y over the norm of x times the norm of y, which is negative 6 over the square root of 30 times the square root of 22. Okay, and so that means that theta, the angle between the two, is just going to be the inverse cosine of this number. Right, which you can plug in and check. Okay, I think you get about 103 degrees. Okay. <clears throat> All right, excellent. Okay, I think, I think we'll, well, one more theorem and then we'll take a pause before we jump into the next section. This theorem follows immediately from what we just discussed, from this uh, construction we just worked through. So let's let x and y be non-zero vectors in Rn. And let theta be the angle between them. Then, a couple of things, right? First one, x dot y is greater than 0 if and only if 0 is less than or equal to theta is less than or equal to pi over 2. Second thing, x dot y is equal to 0 if and only if theta is pi over 2. And the third thing, x dot y is less than or zero, less than zero, if and only if uh, pi over 2 is less than theta, which is less than or equal to pi. And this should be strictly less than, sorry. And so what is this saying? Well, it's saying the dot product is, uh, starting with the middle thing in particular, the dot product is equal to zero if and only if theta, the angle between the two vectors x and y, is pi over 2. Okay, And it's saying that the dot product is positive if theta is an acute angle, and the dot product is negative if theta is an obtuse angle. Right? Now if we kind of look up here, we can see that cosine of theta is equal to this, right? So. You, I, we won't go through the proof formally, but I'll give you a sketch of what you would want to check here. So the denominator here is always positive, right? So if if this is going to be negative, if cosine of theta is negative, which it can be negative, obviously, then it's got to come from the dot product, right? And so the dot product is positive whenever theta is in the quadrant one, right? So remember from trigonometry, imagine your unit circle. So over here, cos is positive. Over here, negative cos. Okay, and that's what this is saying. So if you're over here, then obviously your angle is between zero and pi over two, which means that this is a positive value, well this is always positive, so that means this must be positive as well. If you're over here, then that means your angle is between pi over 2 and pi, and that means cosine is negative, which means this is negative. Well this is always positive, so if this is negative, then this has to be negative, and that's what you're seeing down here. Right, and then obviously right in the middle, cosine is 0 only in one place, and that's when theta is pi over 2. Right, And so this theta equals pi over 2 leads into naturally into the next topic, which will be orthogonality. And we'll get into that in part B. So I'll end the video here, but we'll start up again in, with part B and we'll just we'll, we'll uh, wrap up with, uh, with this dot product lecture. See you in a few.